Hello, everybody, and welcome to another great episode of My EdTech Life. Thank you so much for joining us on this wonderful Tuesday evening, or it may be well into Wednesday, depending on where it is that you may be joining us from around the world. But wherever you are, thank you, as always, for making My EdTech Life what it is today. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here with you this evening, and I am definitely excited about tonight's show. We're definitely going to be talking a lot about amplifying creativity and just some amazing work. If, if you guys, I should have recorded the pre-chat because, man, that pre-chat was a podcast <laughs> all on its own, but if the pre-chat yeah, pre is going to be anything like today's conversation that we're about to have, I am so thrilled. But before we dive in and I introduce you to my amazing guest, I definitely want to give a big shout out to Goose Chase. Thank you so much, Goose Chase, for being a sponsor of the My EdTech Live podcast. I really appreciate everything that you do. And friends, please go check out Goose Chase if you're interested in creating some interactive lessons for your students, creating amazing learning experiences through scavenger hunts and just little wonderful activities that not only you as a teacher can do, but also your students. Please make sure you visit Goose Chase at goosechase.com and you can use uh, code MyEdTech10 so you can take off 10% off of a district license, a school license, or a personal teacher license. So please make sure you check them out. So thank you so much, Goose Chase. Well, all right, ladies and gentlemen, the moment has arrived and I am excited to introduce my amazing guest. I had the pleasure of meeting Chris at the Adobe Innovators uh conference that we had in Utah. And I'm, a, I, I'm just going to say that we definitely hit it off on the right foot. Great conversation. It was great connecting. And so this show has definitely been a long time coming. And I'm just really excited to reconnect again with Chris. Chris, how are you doing this evening? Yo, I'm doing fantastic. Um, I just got done with a hybrid class. I work for Islands of Brilliance and we are doing some new programs. And you all know that time when you get out of a class and it's just, it feels really good. Uh, yeah, that's that's where I'm at. So I'm, I'm coming off of the endorphin rush of a really nice class and a good conversation with you. Awesome. Well, I'm excited. Like I said, that pre-chat was amazing. And we're definitely going to learn more about the work that you're doing uh, with Islands of Brilliance. But before we do that, Chris, if you have seen the show, and I know you've told me you have seen the show, uh, you know, this is one of my favorite parts of the show too, where we definitely hear the superhero origin story. And as you know, Chris, I always tell my guests that if you are a guest on the My EdTech Life podcast, it's because you are somebody who's truly, truly doing something that is just really based out of passion. You're doing something that's either amplifying creativity and just bringing technology and just that passion to the forefront. So I would love for you to just really share and make that connection with our audience. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about your superhero origin story. Oh, it's such a fun question. It's honestly one of my favorite parts of this, this podcast is listening to people's backstories. So I'll take you back to 2016. And um, I am in a meeting with a bunch of people at uh, my university. At the time, I was working for University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And I was scratching my head. I was like, are we, are we doing this right? We were talking about assessments. And we had to try to make it just all about efficiency. And um, it was right around that time when there was a lot of really weird stuff happening um, in the country with rhetoric. And there was a lot of weird stuff happening in our system with leadership. And I just asked myself, like, where, where are my leaders right now? Who am I going to follow? And I was journaling one night and I was listening to one of the kind of debates and I was just writing the word me, 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 me all the, all the time. Cause that's all I was hearing was this kind of me rhetoric. And I got up to go do something. And when I came back, the, the notebook that I was writing in was upside down and I saw we, 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 I was like, Oh, maybe, maybe I need to change this question. Instead of thinking about where's my leaders, I need to think about making a space for us. Like, I, I just need to be the leader. So I did what, you know, Hermione does. I went to the library and I started reading a whole bunch of books on leadership. And one of the books that I read was 
Leaders Eat Last by Sinek. And in early chapters, he has a quote uh, from one of the presidents. I can't remember which one, but it's something along the lines of, if you inspire others around you to do more, create more, and be more, then you're a leader. And I was like, well, geez, I, I've been doing that for a large portion of my career. It was like a recognition of a mantle that I was already wearing. And so that was kind of a cool moment. Um, gave myself permission to really just lean in on um, being the kind of focal point in people's space, but not in the like, hey, pay attention to me, in the I've got energy and love to give. And I'm going to do it as good as I possibly can for as long as I can with the time that I've got left on this little little blue zoo. So that's been kind of my origin story was like I had to had to put on a new, uh, like recognize a new mantle. I love it. Now, Chris, now going along with your origin story, I'll, I always love to ask too, was education something that you knew you wanted to go into or was that something that all came in maybe a little bit later in life? Right on. So the education thing has always happened. Um, I, I worked at Pizza Hut and within two days I was teaching other people on the line how to like fling the pizzas. I got a job sweeping the floors at YMCA and within a month I was a strength training coordinator. Um, so like it, the, the patterns were there. Like I always wanted to teach, but I didn't see it as teaching. I saw it as like, oh, I got this figured out. Let me help. Right. If you want the help, let me help. Uh, I can I, like share the load with you. We can do it together. Um, so it had always been that even in art school, when I was like thinking I was I was going to be an artist that shows in museums, I was still having the conversation of well, what's it going to be like to be an art teacher, an art professor. So yeah, Fonz, it's always been teacher, um, and I'm I'm lucky. I was able to go right from grad school, and I did the lecture life. So I was at like six different schools and had a part-time job at Apple and all that other good stuff for, for a while. Um, and then um, for the last decade was working in academia and just switched within the last year to nonprofit life um, and Islands of Brilliance. And I'm teaching the whole time, like everything I'm doing, I'm teaching. So. Absolutely. That's great. And, you know, along with that, you know, I know you mentioned, you know, the whole teaching thing, but also the learning, because I mean, talk about, you know, within two days, you had to learn how to fling those pizzas and then show somebody. Then sure. you went from sweeping and then all of a sudden, you know, strength coach or, you know, or coordinator. So yeah. obviously that that lifelong learner is there too as well. And I think that just really goes hand in hand with the work that you're doing and what we're about to dive into as, you know, like today's, uh, you know, uh, episode title is visual narratives, tech enabled expression. And, you know, you mentioned your background too, you know, going through art school, being an artist. So I want to start off by asking, you know, how did your journey in the arts and technology begin and how did that kind of lead you to your current role at Islands of Brilliance? I, I love that question. Um, Everything starts with empathy, right? And artists have this ability to kind of be sensitive and see patterns, see systems, but they see it through that lens of empathy. Like what would it be to live in that experience? And it's only assumption because we can't actually live in that experience, but we're sensitive to it. We see those patterns, we see those systems. That's the first kind of big thing that I would say that art did for me is it helped me be sensitive to see those things. From there, what changed in my practice was more about um, the technology. So I got a job at grad school, the iPhone had just come out and they were letting anybody work at Apple and I, I applied and I was anybody. And so I started working at Apple and at the time I was literally like painting with mud on paper and doing these perspective things. It was very artsy. Uh, it, but slowly and surely I started seeing how technology wasn't necessarily this thing, right? This like big edifice. It was actually more the behaviors that it enabled and the, the techniques, the actual materials of our devices and all that stuff kind of goes away the same way that language goes away. Like I don't think about English when I'm talking, I'm just expressing. And now I think of that being one of the big things that I'm aiming for in, in my classrooms is that the technology is there, but you're so fluent in it 
that it becomes invisible and you really can just express with it. So that is a change that started with Apple and then it continued as I started, I, I continued working with Adobe um, and I, for the last decade, accumulated so much knowledge. Like it's not a brag to say that I've accumulated this knowledge because it's taken a long time. But now I've got all this stuff. I'm at like the accumulation stage for so much of the learning that I've done that I get to just share and see all these quick potential pipelines with people. So again, it starts with, as an artist, it starts with being sensitive to systems, being sensitive to people's experience, using that empathy as your first skill. Then it ballooned up into how do I use the fluency of technology in such a way to allow that expression, to allow people to tell them, uh, tell their stories. And I, I think that's, that's the big things that art has taught me. I love that. So tell me a little bit now, and I know we're going to get into the islands of brilliance, but I, I really want to know how that came about. You know, you said you, you landed, you, you did, you know, of course, Adobe, the accumulation, but what, what drew you from going to, you know, from academia to nonprofit, and sure. then tell, and then as you tell us that, tell us a little bit more about Islands of Brilliance as well. Awesome, yeah. So it starts in a tomato aisle at a garden shop. I was uh, searching for a very specific kind of tomato, and I bumped into the uh, director of Islands of Brilliance, or the co-director and founder, Mark Fairbanks, and we had been circling in each other's spheres for a while. Uh, but we didn't really know each other that well. Uh, but by reputation, we were both like, hey, let's let's get a coffee, let's get a beer, let's do something. Um, I ended up baking a bunch of scones and going to his backyard garden and seeing his lovely tomatoes. But it started through a conversation. Um, I had recently started the Immersive Media Lab at my college, which was a lab that was focused on emerging creative technologies and their implications. So all the things that we see now, the generative AI, a lot of the acronym soup of AR, MR, XR, VR, all of that stuff, that's what we were on the front lines like examining, um, both like philosophically, but also under the hood, how could you make the code better? And then artistically in design, what's the user experience? How can you express with this? So that was an awesome experience. And Mark was like, hey, how do I pull that knowledge into the islands of brilliance? So uh, this is 2018. I ran an Oculus workshop. They bought a bunch of computers, a bunch of VR goggles, and I ran the workshop. And it was it was really, honestly, a lot of fun. I learned quite a bit about universal design learning or UDL um, and teaching the autistic community. I'm not trained as a special educator, but what I've what I've honestly learned, Fonz, is that if you if you design your curriculum and your materials so that they're not special, that everybody can access them, that they're accessible, uh, that's that's the way to go. So anyway, that was kind of the the turn into Islands of Brilliance, it happened slowly. It was just a couple workshops here and there. Um, like I said, I was at a point in my life where I wanted to get into a leadership position and it wasn't happening at my home institution, but Mark was like, hey, you know, we, we just got, it came into some funding. We can, we can bring you over as the director of technology. And man, he picked me, he saw what I was doing and I'll share a little of that with, with y'all tonight but um, he's trusted me, he's given me a lot of agency and I've been able to build really cool teams and build really cool systems to help people grow. And that's, that's awesome, that's how it happened. Uh, Islands of Brilliance, to answer that question. Um, we're a nonprofit who wants to change the perception around autistic individuals. Um, our whole goal is to uh, think about somebody's spin. So that's their special interest. We all have special interests. One of mine is space, uh, but like something that you just really jazz get jazzed about. Uh, we use that special interest. We pair that person who's got autism with a creative in the community. And it doesn't have to be Milwaukee's community. This is all hybrid. So this could literally be anywhere in the world as long as you're at the same like time as us. Um, like you show up at the same time as us. And then um, we use that special interest as the kind of 
foil, if you will. That's the thing that gets focused on. And at the early stages, around eight or so, we're more or less just engaging with creativity and trying to pull these individuals into a place where they feel comfortable, they can communicate. A lot of the tools that we use give the ability to share their stories visually. They become the um, the master of the topic. They are subject matter experts in their special interest area. So you learn things about SpongeBob and Pokemon and Walking Dead that you didn't know you didn't know. But it's just a delight to sit there and be in the presence of these minds that are just wired differently. There's nothing wrong. It's just a different wiring. And so that's been a big part of the early stages of what Islands of Brilliance does. We have a ton of different programs for that. Where I come in is in the later stages with the 14 plus cohort. I'm running something called Digital Academy and a bunch of different programs that address the needs of a 14 plus population that just so happens to have autism. Wow, you know, that is amazing. You know, the work that you're doing and really the passion and how just, you know, hearing your road to this it's just really like i said I, you know we we're talking pre-chat and i just love the, the storytelling aspect of it and how you landed here and just really how careful you are and and how deliberate you are and just sharing you know the the technology the art piece and more than anything what i love that you mentioned here is hearing their stories hear that that they are subject matter experts whether it be pokemon whether it be spongebob Whatever the case is, you get to hear about it and they feel comfortable sharing because it is what they know. It is what they are experts in. It is their spin, like you said. Yeah. And, you know, it, it kind of reminds me right now about the conversation that we had in the pre-chat. You know, really, I, I guess it was a variation of that. I, I didn't know that there was a term for it, like that spin, but that helped so much in the classroom those last four years before I transitioned into this role is really allowing the students to become those subject matter experts. And I was yeah. kind of just that that learning engineer, and I would engineer at least the, the experience, but Love allowing it. them Love it. to become those subject matter experts by giving them a project to say, okay, guys, I did initial teach, but now you're going to do a little bit of research and I need you to act as that subject matter expert in doing some research. And then at the end, them explaining it in their own style, whether it was a whether it was a Google slide, whether they did a screencast, whether they did a graphic, whether they uh, just got up and presented and just shared the information, the fact that you're able to bring in their passion into it and make that connection, I, I think that is so powerful. So I absolutely That's love that. So so going along with that, you know, you said you're doing the 14 uh, plus or you know year old community. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about how the the creative technology has empowered your students that you've worked with so, thus far. Well, it, I think this might be a pretty good moment to actually show some of the digital whiteboards so that people can see that. But as a as a little setup. Um, one of the things that I like to think about, so I'm the director of technology for Islands of Brilliance, and I, you know, I sat down with Mark and Margaret, the, the co-founders, and um, said, you know, I think our job is to give, uh, give as much fluency to the students as possible, but not necessarily worry about the tool, but think more about the technique and how that technique allows them to share their stories visually, right? And so we we looked at generative AI at the beginning of the year as like, this is this has changed. It was like February when we met and it had already changed like three times since January, as you know. And so um, that was a big focus. And then I had shared with them that I wanted to pull in a lot of the systems that I had built at the college level but make them so that they were a ride on rails and, and kind of build a culture around um, sharing your progress rather than sharing only your products. And I think that has been a fundamental shift that I'm trying to lead. Um, and, I, and I'm in a position where I can put that idea out there that it's not about your, you know, the end of that thing. Because honestly, I don't, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but 
I don't really care so much about that final product. I'll celebrate it. I'll celebrate the efforts, right? But it's really just residue and a brick in the path. Like it's residue of all that effort. It's, it's evidence of you putting all sorts of really good tactics in place. But it's not really the thing that I care about. The thing that I actually care about is what's often in that black box of creativity is the stuff that happens in the process. So my goal at the beginning of the year with my bosses was how, how does how is the tofurkey made or the sausage made, right? Like how can I expose that creative process? And so I, I've been playing with digital whiteboards and this is part of that visual narratives uh, of the title of this podcast is this is the visual narrative of someone's growth over time. And it's structured in such a way that is super versatile. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Fonts, does what I said, like I kind of yes. word salad that. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I am I am here for it. <laughs> Excellent. I, I I sometimes black out when I get so excited. I just start going. Mm -hmm. So I've got Figma up and their boards. Right now, this is a thousand yard stare. So you can't see anything. And that's totally by what I expect. But I just want to talk a little bit about the, the technology here. Digital whiteboards exist in a lot of different permutations. You have Google's version of it. You have Apple's version. There's Mural. There's Miro. Figma and FigJam are connected. I'm uh, attached to Adobe, and there's maybe going to be a relationship between Figma and Adobe sometime. So that's why I'm kind of sticking with Figma for now. But as an Adobe education leader, I really want to be leading the way on how to use these platforms. And so I'm just going to share with you the first thing that I did um, is I, I created a team at Islands of Brilliance, and I'm so proud of this team. We have our, our scrum boards. We have our calendar for the year. We have each one of our uh, sprints here. So like as I zoom in, you can start to see the details, but that doesn't really matter. The thing that I think is really important is if you're running a creative team, creativity should be a big thing that you put out there. And so my team is constantly sharing the different images that they've made. And again, it's like growth over time. You can literally see people's growth as they kind of develop new skills, like from one week to the next. Um, and I'm just, I'm so very proud of them. We've got four quarters under our belts of this. So at Islands of Brilliance, I run the creative technology team. These are four creative technologists. Our team is growing and every day we, we get, we come in and we work. Now that's not the students. But it is important because these are the teachers of the students. And you know what's good for the students is also good for the teacher. So uh, I'm going to show you two different programs that we currently have up. One is something called SideQuest. And you're seeing this from, again, a 1,000 yards away. And then another one is called Quest. Quest is kind of our cream of the crop. Uh, it's what we have for our self-determined students who apply with a project. They get awarded a three-week, six-week, or nine-week project with us, and they have access to two mentors and everyone else who's on the quest for the duration of that time. We meet on Mondays and Fridays. On Mondays, we say what we're going to do. On Fridays, we talk about what we've done, and we give all sorts of feedback. But a moment of growth here, we have a student who is older and is doing some animations on um, a special kind of mammal that's a ancestor of the giraffe. And I had showed this student some techniques from Instagram about using animation and following a path. And then just like what they said about how they followed this path and like I, I asked our students to put the date and to put something on there. And so this is one of our individual students who is like learning brand new skills. But remember how I said I wanted to see what's inside the black box of creativity? This is it, right? This is literally that moment, that milestone of I just learned a new skill and now I'm applying that skill and I can see exactly when it happened. And that is, that's awesome. Um, my team and I are on it too. We're all doing stuff. I'm doing a coloring book for a 
uh, the Karehe Art Coalition, which is a nonprofit that gives scholarships to students in our area, which is totally fun. We have a little dachshund who uh, <laughs> this is totally inside. He finds a chrono collar and he doesn't quite know how to use it, but every time he barks, he jumps to a different ear. And so the coloring book is Barnaby jumping through different years. My, my dachshund is named Barnaby. But yeah, I get to use this as a way to teach my students uh, in Quest, you know, how I'm processing things. Um, so that's Quest. That's one program. It's kind of the, like I said, the cream of the crop. The other program uh, that I run is something called SideQuest. And uh, at, the, at the top of this, I was saying I was just coming off this really wonderful class. So let me talk about SideQuest uh, uh, just as, a, as a, a basic structure here. It happens over two days and it's four hours. So it's literally like a side quest in a video game. It's not the main thing that you do. It's something that you literally derail off your normally scheduled gaming and you go and you grind, you spend a couple hours, you come back with new toys, new skills, new techniques. This is that. So the first night we, uh, I'm gonna actually go back to a, a prior one. This is the uh, side quest where we were focused on AI image generation in Adobe Firefly. The dates on this one were September 12th. It was still in beta and September 13th. It left beta while we, <laughs> while we were in the class. Talk about being on the edge of ed education technology, right? Um, so at the beginning of our of each class, we structure it because all students like structure. So we have a question of the day, and this time the day the question was, um, "You're opening your lunchbox. What's something that would make you laugh when you opened it up?" And so just live, we do image generation based on that question of the day, um, and then we just have like our quick little tech check. We all go through the same tutorial for the first day. I'm literally teaching them how to teach themselves. I make it an explicit point. This is here for you to learn how to teach yourself how to do things. Because often students, especially creative students, are waiting for someone to teach them a technique when YouTube exists. Like everything is out there in multiple ways. So what we do is we lovingly go through and we filter through the topics and we find just the best choicest videos and we put them into the whole entire side quest. And then we find all of our extra videos are turned into little snacks. They're usually like six minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes. These little quick things that are related to the main one that students can go do. Now, the structure, I'll just take a, a second longer on this. It's, it's gorgeous. And I mean it. It's really, it really works. The first night, we're all looking at that same tutorial. We're pausing it. Anybody who's got a question is able to ask that question, everybody's supporting each other and it's hybrid. So we have people, we have a mentor who's in Chicago and the, or I'm sorry, a creative technologist in Chicago and myself. So we're all kind of help doing it all simultaneously, which is, is kind of rad. But then after that first, the first hour, you can see the iterations start to come in. And so we're looking at, we're all following the same tutorial. So we're all learning how to do the basic, you know, text effect and image generation. Um, these are the students. I also keep the like detailed personal information off here so that I can show this without having any, any real concerns. This one's hilarious. This is rainbow colored toad warts was the prompt for, for Shane. <laughs> so funny. Like really, where'd you come up with that homie? I love it. I love it. Um, I asked Garrett how he's doing. He's like, not everybody makes a tiger wolf, but I did. And then after he made this one, he's like, I'm on fire. L literally, I'm on fire. This is so fun. Like he's having a great time. So you can see this is day one. One thing I would say is that mentors do not know the content. So everybody is learning the tutorial at the same time. There's benefit to that because I'm able to teach students how to categorize information as it comes in, because that like having an attachment to a prior bit of knowledge is so helpful and teaching students to like always look for those associations and categories is a part of the lesson. The other thing is that I can kind of get on the same level with them and we're, there's no longer this like weird power imbalance. There's an experience imbalance, sure, but there's not a power imbalance. We're all learning together. And boy, is that, that's really, it's really nice. It's really fun. Um, 
day two comes around. First thing we do, we do another kind of activity. This one was each one add one. And so it started with, you can actually see the sentences, seagulls riding a roller coaster in a theme park was the first one. And then it was neon colored. So each and the next student added neon colors on a roller coaster and the neon colored seagulls riding a roller coaster at night. And you can see that it just kept generating, but that is such a fun way to use this emerging generative technology as a stoke at the beginning of the class. It teaches collaboration. It teaches uh, listening skills, improvisational skills, and it, they, they make something together. Like it's an artifact of their combined effort. And I think that there's a good metaphor in there somewhere. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> anyway, we use our first of our power tools on the second day. So this is coming from Pooja Agarwal's uh, powerful teaching. And it's this idea of retrieval practice. And I'm not going to get into like the brain mumbo jumbo stuff. I do believe in cognitive science backing teaching and learning practices. But at the end of the day, when you're asked to remember something, you're actually refiring all of the parts of your brain that you fired the day before or the week before or the month before, right? Depending on how deep back it was. And it was somewhere while I was reading this book when I realized that learning is really just recall and all of the other stuff is like the synthesis and the higher functioning part. That's interesting. But I've built in to this two day, four hour thing, a power tool where they're trying to remember everything that they can in five minutes at the very beginning. And then the next part of the, the class is they have the option. I love to give my students agency so they can go back and continue working on that main tutorial or they can start doing some snacks. What's even better is they have snacks from all of the prior tutorials too. So they can just kind of go nuts. Today we were working on um, a digital painting class. This is a student who attended virtually this was after like the first hour and this was after the second hour. Um, and I just, you know, I love how all of the students just kind of went for it. Didn't matter their, like, it's not about being good or bad. It's about just gaining the skill, gaining the experience um, and emulating at first and then going on. I realize that I've been talking a lot. I'm going to stop for a second and see if there's any questions or anything that you want to throw in there about side quest or quest. No, not at all. I mean, I'm definitely enjoying this. And, you know, I what I wanted to add to it was really just, I love this work that you're doing. You know, this is something that I, you know, this would work in a regular classroom setting, you know, just kind of putting things together. And I love that, that you mentioned the collaboration, the creation, co-creating together, the, the important skills that you build there, those soft skills that, that are so important that many times we overlook because, again, like we were talking in the pre-chat, it's just so highly test-driven and we, we're we giving standardized tests, but yet, of course, not everybody learns the same way. So why are you standardizing our learning too as well? You know, And I love the fact here that the students have that agency and that is so important, Chris. I, I so love, important. I love this, these artifacts are amazing. And the fact mm -hmm. that you're showing from where they, they began to where they're at now, and they're taking, yeah. you know, making a note of each process and, and learning together and learning more about themselves and literally, you know, becoming that subject matter expert based on the tasks that they're given. And I love to see right now, I'm just admiring the, what they've put together that you see that one student that you said that they just started yesterday, you know, or today with the mm -hmm. watercolor mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. painting. And then after that, he just took off that one right there. I mean, what yeah. a difference. That's less than an hour oh my gosh. of work, right? Like talk about changing the perception. Like these are, they're special. They're not special needs. And I think that that's important. Like there are creative minds that are there and you can you can see just so quickly like how how fast this person's doing and what you can't see is the chat when i said okay it's time to go the person in the chat was like i don't want to stop i could do this all night i could do this all day this is so much fun and i was able to just say that they didn't feel like talking very much today cuz sometimes you don't have a great day right 
it happens. But again, you give them that respect, you give them that agency, and instead of being like, no, you got to talk, you got to turn your mic on. No, I, I was open and they were able to like be present and show up. Um, and I think that gets to the secondary thing, the discovery or something that was driving this, right? Fonz, I, I had said like, I want to reveal what's inside that black box of creativity and break it apart and see the iterations that that lead to the products that we're assessing. Um, I, I call that produce, by the way. I know that's kind of tongue in cheek, but like I'm, I think of all of this as produce rather than a product. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna die on that hill. I think it's a great terminology for what this is. It's all these really fresh, juicy fruits that, that I get to think about and and consume and uh, just enjoy, right? Um, Absolutely. But the deeper thing is. My, my jam for the last couple of years has been creating these virtual spaces where people can see one another for their potential, right? Like they can quickly see each other here and know, you know, like how they're growing. They can give the, each other feedback. They can um, ask each other how different things were working. And I think that's, that's a big important part of this too that I wanna um, get to is show you how I was doing this at the college level. Um, so at the college level, this is my last class that I taught before switching to nonprofit. Um, and it was a, a class on Unreal Engine and Touch Designer. And in this one, I gave each of the college students a little rocket when they started. And I'll just put a little box on this so it's not like super overwhelming. So you can kind of get a feel for what it looked like when a student comes in. Because otherwise, this can be fairly overwhelming when you start with a brand new system like this. So I would, uh, it's called progressive a, a reveal, um, but I would just simply uh, kind of, they'd start with a rocket that looked a lot like this, right? And then as the units went on, I would reveal more of the semester and these would be empty at the beginning. But the thing that I think is really kind of interesting about these three things, Right. Remember, my goal was to show the creative process through iteration, um, but to also kind of change how students were thinking about their grades and their idea of assessment. And then lastly, to make sure that people could see each other for their potential. So I'm going to delete this here so you're, you're not seeing it. Um, there's a reason why all these rockets are together. And it's because while you're learning individually, there's something so compelling about learning with a group of people who are similarly engaged. And all of these folks were all like in the class at the same level. And so I grouped them based on that engagement, not on quality, not on grade, because I actually didn't grade them at all. But it's all about like, I'm in, I'm really engaged. I really want to talk about this and we can have higher level conversations because of that. Um, so that, that's a part of this, this idea that there is a, a group that is kind of supporting each other, inspiring each other, giving each other formative feedback, heck, giving each other summative feedback, like, why not? Um, but let's talk about that feedback. Um, the students were trained, and it took some training, right? Like, this doesn't happen overnight, to put their iterations into this space for the unit. And so the very first iterations that come in, they look like this, like literally it's a blank space, right? And then they scale these things down. They start to show how they're learning the new skills over time. You can start to see like when they're leaving notes, yeah, I'm gonna start over. <laughs> I made grass. <laughs> um, again, this is like a pretty high tech piece of software. Unreal Engine is, is no joke, um, but you can, I kind of train them to show like, you know, hierarchically, visually curating their information, which is very much an ISTE thing, to like make sure that they are putting forward information that validates their relationship to the unit's essential questions. That right there is an important sentence. This stuff validates these sentences. These look a lot like a rubric, Fonz. They're not. I, very, I was very specific about how I started these self-affirming statements. These are information statements, but they're information that always starts with you and it always 
finishes with either you can, you understand, or you know how to. These are self-affirming relationship statements that are just so happen to be the essential questions of this unit. And what the students do is at the beginning of the semester or the beginning of the unit, I'll ask them, okay, tell me, do you understand the basic terminology of this part of this thing? And they have this little slider that they can be like, mm, I've heard of it. I don't, I would need help, right? Um, but this little slider, this is the thing that I think is so cool because it's them telling me what their relationship is over the duration of the unit and it doesn't like go away like all of these statements are still able to be changed throughout the semester as well and so it's not like the deadline passes and therefore none of this information is important no i'm scaffolding it in such a way that the information from unit one is going to absolutely support what we're doing in unit two but that doesn't mean that like something that was yellow or red in unit one you know, that's a simple mapping, red, I don't understand it. Yellow, I, I've seen it, I would need some help. Green, I totally understand it. Um, I think the new thing here is, you know, for seeing each other's potential is this last one. And I got this just so very recently. Um, and next time I implement this structure, it's this blue icon means that I am ready to teach this without looking it up. Now, here's the, the reason why I think that's so important. Fonz, I don't really want people to think about me at all in the classroom, right? I want them to think about each other. I want them to understand that this resource that's right next to them, all five of these people, is way more important than that guy in the classroom that's at the front of the room, right? Like, if I can somehow find a way for them to share authentically in a validated way that they are ready to teach anyone else that's around them just by putting that to a blue oh, that's so cool now i've got a whole classroom that's set up so that you can just quickly say oh you know how to do this can you show me at break can you show me how to do this and like i've set that conversation up without after ever having to lift a finger i think that's so cool so this little complex of a validated throwdown space self-affirming essential questions that by the way has links directly to the youtube sometimes to the minute of what they would need so if i do have like a go-getter who wants the information right now it's right there for them and then this interactive slider that lets lets the student thinking and learn uh, teaching and learning geek out this is a feedback driven metacognition unit right like i can I understand my relationship to this knowledge. Here is how that works. And under the hood, that's all that looks like. <laughs> that's it. It's just a, it's just a GIF. Or, I'm sorry. It's just a PNG with a little hole cut out. Um, I just proposed a thing for ISTE to teach people how to make these, but we'll see. We'll see if that, if that goes through, we'll see, cross our fingers. So that's, that's it. Like that's a lot of what I'm about. I really want to thank you for giving me an opportunity to share this. Do you have any questions? <laughs> of course. Wow. I mean, really, there's so much here. here. Well, there, it, was, <laughs> right? there was so much, honestly, but it's so much greatness. And, you know, to see a practitioner like yourself, you know, bringing the ed tech to another level, like this is completely new to me. I had never seen this, but the fact that you are that subject matter expert in this, and now you are putting it in the hands of students and for a specific community that is doing some amazing things. To me, it just goes to show, like you mentioned, it's like, hey, you know, it, it giving them agency and giving them opportunity to create with a little bit of guidance and a little bit of learning, uh, you know, engineering right there and setting them up your passion really comes through, which is something that you mentioned. And we talked about it in the pre-chat, which is finding that potential within you, you know, and, and doing the work. I mean, Chris, I, I am in awe of this practice, honestly, because of the way that it does draw out that potential for that one student, whether it was in academia or whether it's here through Islands of Brilliance, you are drawing something out of them that many people maybe never thought of. And, and going back to our, our, our conversation about 
listening to stories and, and pulling the story, like getting out more of what's there, you know, you're doing that. And for me, it's so like, it's, it's filled my bucket today to know <laughs> that there's somebody that is doing this and, and the work that you're doing and the love that you're putting behind it, because it, it really shows the passion that you have for your craft, for your students, and in building them up. And yes, you're showing that potential. Now, I love the fact that they get to see also their creative process and learning and reflecting and refining and reiterating. And I love the way that you put it, you know, that, that final product, yes, it's great, but the work that went in to get to that final product, that is the amazing thing. You know, and, and I kind of liken it to maybe ourselves. It's like, I, I know like, and okay, I don't, I don't want to sound conceited or anything, but I mean, I remember when you and I first met and you're like, oh my gosh, like, like, oh my gosh, it's you, like, you know, my tech life and this and that. And I was like, well, that's, that's kind of weird. Like, you know, getting that kind of reaction, but, but I guess in that sense, making that connection of, you know, that the years that I've put into doing this the work that goes behind it. And people oftentimes they see the finished product, but they don't see the behind the scenes, the iteration, the failures, the grit, the resilience, the learning and the hours of work. And here, the way that you set this up, the students get to see that. And it's a beautiful artifact. And yeah. that's what I love, man. Yeah, you're really, they get to see their potential they get to see their growth and it's something that is visible and it's something that they can easily share with anybody and anybody can see, wow, what an amazing progression. So yeah, I am in awe of this. And and I hope that really ISTI like accepts your, your, uh, we'll see. yeah, we'll see. accepts your proposal and everything. Well, but, people you know, here, here at least, right? Yeah. Like this crowd is my people. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, we're still not, I still have a couple of questions, but you know, I know yeah. we're running short on time and everything. And I yeah. respect your time, but I, I got to know, you know, at least maybe if I can get two more questions sure. in and so hey, I've on. I've got but, time. I'm, oh, I'm okay. Perfect this, is, perfect. this is for you. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I, I wanted to get to the, this following question because I know when I met you and right now you said, you know, you're really into space. You know, I noticed some art that you had over yes. there in Utah, yes. but then I also know that you're really heavily into roller coasters as well. You yeah. know, and so, and in your your bio, I know you describe yourself as kind of like a half hippie, half geek. So I want to ask you, you know, how did these two facets of your personality influence your approach right in on. ed tech? Yeah, well, the ed tech spin here. This is this is going to be interesting to to aim it there. So let me just, I'll start this way. I'll give you an example of the kind of hippie nature of this. I don't look at what I just showed you as digital whiteboards or as like all these visual artifacts. In fact, I think of them as gardens. I think of them as spaces that I've put a lot of time and care into preparing for people who get to go in them and grow in them to show me how they grow rather than me telling them like, hey, welcome to my digital painting class. This is how you're gonna do it. And these are the dates that I want you to turn things in. It's welcome to this class. I cannot wait to see how we grow together. And we're gonna get to see how we grow together. That's pretty hippie, if you ask me. The statement, the more I do in the garden, I'm sorry, the statement, the more I confuse what I do in the garden with what I do in the classroom, the better everything gets is a statement that comes from that hippie nature. The geek nature is somebody who's just not afraid to experiment and fail and experiment and try and experiment and pivot and experiment and push into all these new technologies that are going to help my students express their stories visually, that are gonna help me make those garden spaces for people to see one another for their potential they're going to help me see what is inside that black box of creativity so I can actually break apart the process. And I know I'm hitting my talking points, right? Like talking points, but these are the things that truly drive me. And that sounds a little hippie. It sounds a little geeky and I'm totally fine with that. Um, I love the roller coasters more because I love my brother. 
like he loves to go on roller coaster rides and i was like eh, i get to spend like 36 hours with you sure and we just so happened to ride like 24 roller coasters in 36 hours but you know whatever <laughs> not everybody goes does theme parks the way we do theme parks but it's pretty fun um the space thing that's like i'm i'm i, I grew up very religious and now i'm i'm much more like we're all connected. We're all moving together on this big blue zoo that just so happens to have the ability to point out and say, hey, isn't that beautiful? Like, that's kind of a neat moment for me. And so that's that's really why I like space because it makes me feel so precious and so insignificant simultaneously. I, I kind of unhinge myself from this time that I get to live on this earth and think my choices, my actions are gonna have an upstream effect on generations that come after me. So I'm gonna use this. I'm gonna try to do what I can to not do what was done to me in education, but try to find new ways um, for other people to try new, new avenues and new approaches. So that's my half hippie, half geek spun to ed tech. Does that? Yes, <laughs> I absolutely <laughs> love it. And it, honestly, like it really does come together so well. I mean, I can see it. I can hear it. I, I mean, just with what you shared with me and the way that you, I mean, you're just so such an awesome person. Like, honestly, like, you know, everything that you're doing, I don't know, it just comes together yeah. in an amazing way, man. So just keep yeah. doing what you're doing, Chris. Like you're Thank definitely you. somebody that's inspirational and just definitely somebody that's doing something wonderful and leaving a mark. And, and again, going back, I guess, going back to that garden, you're really planting a wonderful seed in the lives of every single person that you're working with, you know, whether it was through academia here in islands of brilliance too. And even, you know, when we get to meet in Utah or wherever yeah. we get to meet next, man, you're definitely yeah. putting some seeds there. And, uh, you know, I'm loving it, man. Cause you're definitely, cool. you know, reaping some amazing, amazing produce <laughs> in that sense. But yeah. it's just wonderful, man. It's wonderful. And it's just really exciting. All right, man. Well, I mean, I've had a wonderful time and maybe yeah. we'll definitely need to be back for a part two because there's definitely so much more to dive I into. Get. But you will definitely schedule that for a later time and really get into it a little bit more. But before we go, uh, I always love to end the show with the following three questions. So, Chris, if you are ready to go, uh, hopefully, like I said, if you've seen the show, you're familiar with the last three questions. So right now, my first question to you is, we know that Superman's greatest weakness was kryptonite. So anywhere, anytime kryptonite was close by, I might know it was just like made him cringe, just weakened him completely. So I want to ask you, Chris, and from your perspective, in the current state of education, what would you say is your current edu kryptonite? Yeah, I thought a lot about this one. And I think right now that it's it's kind of a toss up and both come from policy, policy that allows for charter schools to exist. And yet yeah, charter schools have a place, but how they're like siphoning off money from the bigger education system is tricky. And I don't want to step on anybody's toes with that, but that's like one thought. The other thought is all of the institutional kind of power structures that have been built into academia to the point where like we don't really know where they came from some of them are a bit folklory in fact like why is why do we have grades like where where did those come from and so i've really been questioning the adherence to a lot of the educational folklore and that's a bit of my kryptonite when people just blindly are like well this is how you're supposed to do it there you go. That is a great answer. I'm, I'm with you on that second one. It, it's like, I know I, I had Amy Mayer maybe probably like about a year ago and she said, oh, it's the twatty. The, this is the way we've always done it. And it's dangerous. You know, those to me are like the most dangerous words. And I know I posted recently that clip and I said, you know, just because those policies or those procedures work at that given time doesn't mean that they're cur currently working now. You know, we need to get out of our comfort zones and think things through differently because the times have changed and we need to yeah. make sure that we adapt. So yeah, definitely. All right, Chris, question number two is if you could have a billboard with anything on it, what would it be and why? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it would be the sentence identify as neurodivergent. Are you creative? And then a QR code. 
that would be it because I want more people to who like, cause I know that there are students that I talk to in Milwaukee who are in like Albuquerque and Saskatchewan and other multi-syllabic cities throughout the world that, that I want to work with, that I want to help grow and people don't know about me. So I think this, if you know of anybody who is autism, uh, has autism and is creative and would benefit from our programs, send them my way. Yeah. That would be what's on my billboard. Love it, man. Love it. Thank you so much for sharing that. And the last question for you is aside from work, aside, let's say from, you know, your normal duties, as far as maybe even tech, you know, it will, we'll put tech there in that, that you can't pick this, but do you have a hobby or a favorite activity that you wish you could turn into a full-time profession? Yeah, I think when I retire, I'm going to become a gardener somewhere. Maybe it's for my own property, but let's face it, I'll probably never retire. But I I love gardening. I love making spaces for things to grow and going through that whole cycle. I think it's just endlessly fun. I uh, love sitting in my garden with a cup of coffee and just being present. Again, the more I confuse what I do in the garden with what I do in the classroom, the better everything is. Love it. Oh man, that is awesome. Awesome. Yeah, you know, my I honestly I had my money on being a professional roller coaster rider. <laughs> That's what I thought that you were gonna say. Yeah, no. Uh, you know, yeah. the, the garden, definitely wonderful, Chris. Well, man, honestly, thank you so much. Like this was such a just I don't know, man. This is just a joyous conversation, man. Like I'm still like in awe and processing, but like I said, I really loved you opening up, Chris, like, you know, I got to know you more, obviously, over there at Adobe, it was very short, you know, very quick and everything, but yeah. being able to speak with you and just hear you share your work, your thought, your thinking, your, you know, background and, and just all coming together tonight in this amazing conversation was just something that was wonderful, man. And it's definitely memorable for me. So thank you yeah. so much for being a guest. Thank you so much again for what you're doing and the work that you continue to do through Islands of Brilliance. And you heard it here, guys. If you know anybody that would benefit from this amazing program, please make sure you reach out to Chris and you'll get all his information there in the show notes. You'll see the website for Islands of Brilliance in case you want to share that with any of your friends or anybody that you would see that would benefit from it. Make sure you get in contact or maybe even message Chris directly either through Instagram or through socials or anything. Feel free to reach out. The The information will be there in the, in the show notes and everything. But again, thank you so much, man. I really yeah. appreciate you. And for all our audience members that joined us i know i saw willie here in the chat briefly thank you so much for joining and for all of you that are going to be catching this on the replay later on this evening or tomorrow morning thank you as always for making my tech life what it is today i really appreciate all of the support the likes the shares the follows guys we've been doing this for about three years and six months now and it just continues to get better and i'm just so excited to bring you amazing conversations just like this evening with Chris, with so many wonderful creatives, educators, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, practitioners, because we definitely need to have some of these amazing conversations within our education space to continue to help us better ourselves each and every single day. So please make sure you stop by our website so you can check out the rest of the other amazing episodes. So again, we have 236 episodes with this one tonight. So make sure you stop by myedtech.life, myedtech.life dot life where you can check out some more amazing episodes from just wonderful people that you can take some knowledge nuggets from and sprinkle them on to what you are already doing great. And if you'd love to support our mission, stop by our merch store, get yourself a cap, a hat. Um, you know, we've got cups, whatever it is, you know, all of that guys goes back to our show just so we can continue to bring you amazing conversations week in and week out. But as always, thank you guys for all of your support. And my friends, until next time, don't forget, stay techie.